Hello, good afternoon to all of you. I hope all of you are doing well. So in today's class, we are going to discuss about software testing. Now, software testing is an explicit phase in software life cycle model that is purely dedicated to detecting all possible errors that may be there or defects that may be there in a software product. Now, uh, in, in certain situation, the the software program may fail to deliver the result as expected. Now, if it so happens, if the if the software product, uh, program fails to deliver the result, then uh, it implies that there exists a condition under which the software system has failed. So, what we need to do is we need to initiate a debugging process, and then we need to find out the point of origination of the error, and then we need to initiate a corrective uh, corrective action. So. Uh, if in situation a program fails to deliver uh, the expected results, so it implies that there exists a, uh, a failure condition. So what we need to do is we need to debug, we need to find the point of origination of the error, and then what we need to do is we need to initiate a corrective action. Now, in practice, howsoever, howsoever in practice or in a real world situation, uh, even though after rigorous testing or even though after thorough testing, it is very difficult to qualify a software system to be 100% error free. Why? Because it may so happen that the test cases with which you are testing the software system with may not be capable of identifying all possible errors that may be there, that may be there in the software system. Right? Okay. So, uh, because it is very difficult to test the system with all possible values, so what we do is we select uh, representatives of those values these are called as test cases so we test the system with test cases so it may so happen that the test cases may not be capable of uh, uh, detecting uh, all possible errors so so that's the reason why what we cannot do is we cannot assure that the software product is 100 percent error free now since you see the uh, the input domain of uh, most of the software product is very large it is not practical to test the software product exhaustively with all the input values so this is what we are talking about so it is impossible for one to test the software system with all possible values that the software uh, system may take in so what we do is we take a candidate representatives these representatives are called as uh, are called as test cases. So we test the system with test cases and it may so happen that the test cases may not be capable of uh, detecting errors. So testing does howsoever expose many error. Testing provides a practical way of reducing defects in a system therefore they are therefore increasing the user's confidence in the, the system that is being developed. Now testing is, an, uh, testing is a very important development phase right so as we have discussed testing is a very important development phase and maximum amount of effort out of all the phases in the development phase is required for testing so it requires maximum amount of effort among all the phases that are there in the development phase right so here in case of testing maximum number of software engineers are, are, are deployed in order to carry out this particular activity so testing of software product is in fact as much challenging as in uh, as uh, the, any of the other developmental activities such as uh, specification design and code and also testing involves a lot of creative thinking right so these are some of the facts about testing so in today's class what we learned about is we have learned about what is testing right okay uh, uh, we have learned about uh, now, why uh, we cannot qualify a soft software system to be 100% error free, right? Again, okay. uh, um, we, we have seen that the domain of input value may be very large, so making it impossible to test the software system with all possible values, okay, right? But testing does allow us in uh, reducing the total amount of error content that is there in the program. Thus, uh, what it leads to, it, it leads to increase user con user's confidence in the system that is being developed. And uh, we have also learned that testing is uh, a phase in the, in the development cycle that takes the maximum amount of effort, which implies maximum number of people are deployed for executing the tasks that are related to testing. And it is as important as any other phase in software lifecycle model like specification design and coding. And testing does involve creative thinking. Now let us try to understand the concepts that are related to testing. So let us try to understand what is error what is fault and what is failure. Now, a failure is a manifestation of error, definitely. So if there is an error, then the system uh, 
it fails to deliver the result as expected. So that is what we have learned in the previous slide. So mere presence of an error may not lead to failure. So it may so happen that um, uh, pre presence of certain kind of error may not lead to failure. Now a fault, right? A fault is an incorrect state entering due, uh, uh, that has been entered during the program execution. So a variable value is different from what it should be. So a fault is an incorrect state to which the program has entered during execution, okay? That means uh, a, a variable has a different value as that of expected. Now, a fault uh, may not uh, may or may not uh, lead to uh, lead to failure, right? So this is this is uh, this is the difference between fault and a failure. So a failure is manifestation of an error, right? That means uh, because of error, there is a failure, right? So mere presence of uh, error may not lead to failure in certain situations, right? So a fault is an incorrect state entered during program execution because uh, the variables are not capable of taking the, um, capable of taking the expected values. So a fault may or may not lead to failure. So this is very much important, right? Now, let us try to understand what is a test case and what is a test suit. So a software system cannot be tested by all tested with all possible input values, right? A software system cannot be tested with all possible input values. So what we do is we so we we generate uh, candidate representatives for each and every uh, set of value. Now these uh, candidate representatives are called as uh, test cases. So test cases are representative of the actual input in the set of input values. So uh, uh, then a software is tested with the with with the test cases, and the ability of the test cases to identify the error is judged. So. What we need to do is we need to ensure that whatever test cases we are generating, right, that is capable of representing the input set should be carefully designed. So there has to be a proper mechanism or technique adapted in order to uh, select the test cases that are capable of representing the, the input set. So it, it is very much important for us to adapt to a, a very, uh, very, uh, very correct and uh, precise way of uh, selecting test cases that are capable of representing, in, representing the input value, and and the collection of test cases are called as a test suit, right? Okay. So now just see here what we have is we have we test a particular module uh, with a, with a set of uh, representatives. These representatives are called as test cases, and collection of test cases uh, is called as test suit so what we do is we build up multiple test suits for functions that are that are pertaining to a system that is to be tested again i'll repeat it so it is very difficult uh, it uh, it will be very difficult and uh, and uh, and a time consuming process for if if you test the system with all possible values in the input set so instead of testing the system with all possible values in the input set what we do is we select candidate representatives Right now, the candidate representatives of the input set uh, is called as test cases, and the collection of test cases is called as test suit. Now, uh, how do we define a test case? Now, test case is a triplet that uh, is defined with the help of three important components. These are called as ISO, which stands for input, state, and output. Right. So, what is the input value that you are providing to the to the function? At what state of the function and what is the output that is expected from the function? So, uh, so a, a test case is uh, well defined is, is better defined with the help of a triplet that is ISO, which stands for state as an input, state, and output. So, I is the data to be input to the system. S is the state of the system at which the uh, the data input is provided to the system, right? And O is the expected output from the system. So, each and every test case has to have uh, uh, has to have a definition in terms of input, the state, and the output. Now, let us try to differentiate between two important terms that are frequently used in testing. These are called as verification and validation. So, in order to sim create a simple, very simple correlation, verification basically implies, are we doing the things right? Right? Are we doing the things right? And validation basically implies, are we doing the right thing? Now, just see, uh, they, they is, they, 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 there is a huge difference between these two uh, phrases. Uh, verification, again, I'll repeat it. Are we doing the things right? So, verification basically talks about compliance. Okay, And validation, are we doing the right thing? 
it basically demands correctness so verification demands compliance and validation demands correctness so verification is the process of determining whether the output of one of the phase of development conforms to the uh, to the previous phase right again okay. so output of one of the phase of development conforms to its previous phase so whether it follows certain standard or not whereas validation is the process of determining whether the fully developed system conforms to the SRS document or not so whether whatever you have implemented is a correct implementation or representation of the function so verification is for compliance and validation is for correctness so verification is concerned with the phase containment of the error whereas the aim of validation is that the final product should be error free should be free of errors so uh, um, the, the compliance of one phase to another phase is what is looked upon by verification and the ability to generate the correct result by the system is what is judged by validation so this is a very important uh, distinction that uh, is uh, often uh, placed in the question paper that what is the difference between verification and validation so verification um, it tries to um, imply uh, to um, compliance and validation is correctness right so now so how to design test cases right again okay. now this this is this is a very important activity in case of testing uh, now there are different ways of designing test cases so uh, one of the ways is called as white box testing the other one is called as black box testing uh, both has its own uh, set of techniques right so uh, designing of test case is a very important step in case of uh, software testing because uh, the way how we de 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 uh, design test case uh, dictates the effectiveness of the testing procedure right so how efficiently uh, we dictate uh, we, we design the test cases that efficiently uh, the, uh, the the errors may be detected in, in software product so uh, the, the ability of the testing phase purely depends on uh, the uh, the way how the test cases for uh, for a particular module of a particular system has been designed so it's 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 a very important uh, it's a very important uh, sub activity of software testing that uh, we need to design uh, the test cases in a very proper manner so uh, software uh, design of test uh, test cases so exhaustive testing of any non trivial system is impractical so now you see here what we cannot do is we cannot test the the software system with all possible values so what we need to do is we need to construct the the number of values with which we have to, with which we are testing the system so uh, exhaustive testing of any non trivial uh, system that means a complex system is impractical because the domain of input value is extremely large so what we need to do, do is we need to design uh, uh, test cases that are very much optimal uh, uh, optimal in the context that it's of reasonable size and it's capable of disclosing as many as uh, errors as possible so because that is also one of the uh, the, 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 the key focus point is that whenever you're designing test cases the test cases should be uh, of reasonable size and it should be capable of detecting as many number of problems as possible now it may so happen that the test cases may be randomly selected or some method may be used right so if test cases are selected randomly then it may so happen that many test cases may not contribute uh, and significantly to the test suit right okay so if test cases are randomly selected it may so happen that uh, the test cases that are selected may not contribute to the uh, to the uh, to significantly to the uh, test suit that is it would not detect errors that are um, that are not being detected by any other case, uh, any other test case in the test suit. So it may so happen that uh, a set of test cases may detect only one possible type of error, right? And uh, it may not be capable of uncovering uh, the other types of errors that may be potentially hampering the working of the, uh, the, the system. So it's very important for us to devise some uh, proper mechanism for selecting the test cases. Now, So testing a system using a large number of randomly selected test cases does not imply that um, as many number of errors will be uncovered. So this is also that is this is the point that we were trying to focus on. So if you, if you keep on testing the software system with a random set of test cases and expect it to uh, uncover 
as many number of defects as possible it does not happen so so there has to be a proper mechanism in which the test cases are selected so that test cases are capable of uncovering as many number of uh, errors that may be that may be there in this in the software system now it is very difficult for the test cases to uncover all possible types of errors but uh, to the maximum extent possible the test cases should be capable of uncovering the uncovering the uh, the errors that are there. So systematic approaches are required in order to design optimal test suit. So each test case in, test case in this uh, test suit should detect different errors, right? So this is a very important aspect that one needs to, one needs to focus on whenever testing is done. So we need to place test cases in the test suit in such a manner that uh, each of the test case should be capable of uncovering at least uh, at least. Uh, or the capable of detecting errors. Now there are essentially two different types of designing test cases. Uh, these are called as black box and white box uh, testing. So black box testing and white box testing, uh, these are not actually testing uh, mechanism. These are test case design mechanism, right? Now uh, black box testing. Now black box testing is a uh, test case design mechanism where test cases are designed taking into consideration only function specification of the software without having in knowledge about the internal structure of the software system. Now this is this is a, a very important characteristics of black box testing. Now in case of black box testing what we tend to do is we tend to design test cases without taking into consideration the internal implementation or we take into consideration only the uh, the functional specification of the software system. So for this reason, uh, um, black box testing is also referred to as functional testing, right? Okay. So if we consider the internal implementation of the software system while testing, now that is what uh, white box testing is all about. But in case of black box testing, as the name says, we perceive a system as a as a black box, and from the specification document, we uh, take in the or draw the input and the output value, and provide the input the provide the input value, and see whether the system is capable of uh, generating the the specific output value in the specification document or not. Now likewise white box testing. So white box testing is a testing uh, test case design mechanism where what we do is we design test cases based on the internal implementation of the software system, right? Okay. So uh, for designing uh, test cases using white box testing, what we need is we require knowledge about the internal structure of the software system. It is also called a structural testing. Uh, so uh, in this uh, in the, uh, uh, in this uh, so here this this particular point is irrelevant here right okay but uh, in, whenever we are talking about white box testing so white box testing requires um, knowledge about the internal implementation of the the system and uh, it's also called a structural test. Now there are different different versions of white box testing and different versions of uh, uh, black box testing. So in case of black box testing we have uh, equivalence class part testing and boundary value analysis. Whereas in the case of white box testing, we have uh, statement coverage, we have branch coverage, we have um, we have uh, condition coverage, and we have path coverage. So we're going to discuss each of this, right? Again, okay. so black box testing. For now, just remember we have black uh, white, uh, uh, equivalence class partitioning, and then uh, boundary value analysis. And in case of white box testing, we have statement coverage, we have uh, branch coverage, we have condition coverage, and we have path coverage. Now let us talk about black box testing. Now black box testing is also uh, referred to as functional testing, as we have discussed in the pre uh, previous class. Now in order to design test cases using black box testing, what we need to do is we need to have a very good understanding of the SRS document. But what we do not need is we do not need uh, the, the knowledge about the way how the internal structure of the program looks like. So this, uh, so here to see, uh, in case if you are de designing this uh, test case using white box testing, uh, what we need to do is we need to know about the, the design and the code. But now as the focus on black box testing, so black box testing basically requires a very good understanding of the SRS document and it does not require knowledge about the internal implementation of the software system. Now there are two categories of black box testing. So this, these are called as equivalence class partitioning and boundary value analysis. Now let us try to understand what is equivalence class partitioning. Now equivalence class partitioning basically refers to a mechanism of dividing the input set into equivalence classes, right, or equivalent classes. Now it may so happen that uh, in situation, in situation, uh, that uh, a, a function may take in value from a range, or a function may take in value from a discrete set, right? So please listen to me carefully. Uh, 
in it may happen that there may exist a situation where a function takes in value from a uh, from a, from a discrete set or it takes in value from a uh, from a range of uh, from a from, from a range of values right okay so in case of equivalence class partitioning depending upon whether the function takes in value from a range or it takes in value from a discrete set what we tend to do is we tend to create equivalent classes okay so now just see here so input values to a, pro a particular program is partitioned into equivalent cla equivalent classes right okay so here if a function takes in value from a range right if a function takes in value from a range say for example uh, if a function takes in value from a range in between 1 to 100 right now there exists a range that is from 0 to minus uh, say for an example minus x and from 101 to positive x right so where x can be any large value so just see in case if a function takes in value from a range right in case if a function takes in value from a range then it implies that there is a range below the minimum value of the range and there exists a range that is above the maximum value of that particular range so in situation where function uh, takes in value from a range what i need to have is i need to have three different classes one class of values less than that of the uh, the lower bound and one class of value greater than that of the the upper bound right so you have two bounds in case of range we have the lower bound and we have the upper bound so one range beyond uh, below the lower bound and one range above the uh, the uh, the the uh, the maximum bound right okay so just see that is the way how what we do is we tend to partition the the uh, the input value right so in case if in case uh, if a function takes in value from a range then what we have is we have three classes out of which one is a valid class and two are invalid classes the two invalid classes are uh, one is below the uh, the lower bound and one is uh, beyond the upper bound okay so that is the way how equivalent classes are created the, uh, that is the way how equivalence classes are created. Now, in situation where uh, a function takes in value from a discrete set, then what we do not have is we do not have range associated with the value. So, in that case, we have only two classes. One is called as the valid class and the other one is called as the invalid class. So, let us try to understand it in greater detail. So, here in case of equivalence class partitioning what we have is we have the uh, the input values to the program being partitioned into equivalent classes so partitioning is done in such that program behaves in a similar way to every input value uh, belonging to an equivalence class so here what is the assumption the assumption is that for all possible values belonging to a particular class for all possible values belonging to a particular class, the function is capable of exhibiting similar behavior, right? Okay? So that is the assumption that we have. So in case of equivalence class partitioning, we partition the, uh, the input value into equivalence cla equivalent classes where it is assumed that the system is capable of behaving similarly with every possible values from a given class right so that's why uh, so now what we do is so instead of taking all possible values in that particular class uh, we uh, take a representative that represents that particular class so we'll uh, understand uh, it with the help of example now why define equ equivalence class right now just see uh, what we can do is we can just test the code with one representative value from a given equivalence class assuming that it is as good as testing uh, the the uh, the program with any other value in that particular equivalence class. So now just see, uh, it is uh, so. For an example, if you create a correlation, so every class has a class representative, right? Okay. So if I have want to seek opinion about the class, so what I do is I call the class representative and seek his opinion, assuming that class representative is capable of uh, providing the opinion of the entire class so it's as good as that so in case of equivalence equivalence class partitioning we divide the entire uh, input set into equivalence classes or equivalent classes where from each equivalent class we select one representative assuming that he is capable of representing all possible values in that particular class so how do you determine equivalence class right so first what we need to do is we need to examine the input value as i've already said what we need to do is we need to examine the input value and determine and see what kind of value the function takes in so whether the function takes in value from a discrete set or whether a function takes in value from a range so if a function takes in value from a range then what we need to do is we need to 
uh, this uh, decide upon one valid and two invalid classes. Just see if a function takes in value uh, between one to five thousand. Now there must be a range that is below one. That is from, for an example, say let us say minus ten thousand to zero, and there must be a range that is from five thousand one to a positive ten thousand. So just see here we have a range below the uh, the uh, the, uh, the the minima of the uh, the range, and we have a range above the uh, the maximum limit of the range, uh, the uh, the range, right? So we have a range below one, and we have a range above five thousand. So we have two invalid classes that is beyond the range and we have valid class 1 to 5000 so here what we need to have is we need to have uh, three classes uh, two invalid and one valid class now if a function takes in value from a discrete set so an example if there is no range associated so then what we need to have is we need to have one valid and one invalid class right so that is the way how it actually works. Now let us. Uh, so this this is what we have learned. You see here. So you see here we have a range below one and we have a range above five thousand, right? Again. Okay. So when we design test uh, te uh, test cases, we take into consideration our value. You see minus five is uh, is belonging to a range that is less than that of one. And 6,000 is belonging to a range that is beyond 5,000, right? So these are the two invalid values. So minus 5 and 6,000 and 500 is a valid value because it's between 0 to 5,000. So that is the way how it actually works. Now, boundary value analysis. Now, boundary value analysis is, 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 a, is a kind of black box testing where we try to check in uh, the working of the program with the boundary values of a given range. So, in situation where a function takes in value from a range, so what we have is we have the the bounds of the range. So, for example, if I say one and uh, one to five thousand is a range, so now it has a is a it has a boundary value. So, one of the boundary values one, and the other one another boundary value is five thousand. So, what we need to do is we need to check the capability of the function uh, to deliver the result with this boundary value. So, that's called as boundary value analysis. So, in case of boundary value analysis, we tend to design test cases take into consideration boundary values of a given range. But that is true only if a function takes in value from a range. So. Now, uh, the test case should, uh, should uh, include 1, 5000 and uh, the other set of values as well, right, okay. So here, in case of boundary value analysis, you see, so some uh, typical programming error occurs uh, in situation where the boundary values are not, uh, 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 are not managed properly. So here, what we need to look for is we need to look for conditions such as less than instead of less than equals to, right, okay. So we, we can need to check the boundary values. Right again, okay. and see whether the the program is capable of de uh, delivering the expected result or not. So in today's class, what we will do, so here you see, here we have specified an example as well. So now we what we need to do is we need to check the system with uh, 0, 1, 5000, 5001. You see, uh, so this is a boundary value. 5000 is a boundary value. One is a boundary value. Zero is a value that is beyond. Uh, or less than one and 5001 is a, a value that is above 5000 right so in today's class what we have learned about is we, we have learned about uh, what is testing what is the importance of testing uh, we have learned about uh, how uh, that uh, we have learned that uh, testing takes uh, the maximum amount of effort of all the development uh, phases in the uh, all of all the development phase in and it is as crucial as uh, specification design and coding phase right and it also involves creative thinking and then we learned about error faults and failures then we learned about what is a test case and we have learned about what is test suit right and then we learned about a distinction between verification and validation and we have learned about the way of designing test cases where we discussed the black box testing and we have discussed uh, equivalence class partitioning and uh, boundary value analysis. So in next class, what we're going to do is we are going to discuss uh, white box testing in a greater detail. So thank you very much. Have a very good day.